greetings to all of you who have been studying end time prophecy along with us on this particular channel. I trust and hope it's been a blessing to you. I know it's generated a lot of questions. That's because we're actually presenting a restoration of end time prophecy on this channel. We're not just repeating uh, what others have taught down through the millennia and the centuries. So in this video, I want to answer the question, will the temple be rebuilt before the rapture takes place? And my quick answer is, I believe the rapture takes place after the temple is rebuilt. So yes, the temple must come first. That's why it's one of the final signs that we will see as this day approaches. Now, these are just not my thoughts, but this is what the Apostle Paul taught the early Christians. And we're going to look at how he taught it, where he got the information from himself. Of course, it was from the Lord, but you have to understand, there is no vision or apparition uh, that does not need to be supported by the written word of God. So whatever Paul believed he got from Jesus, I'm sure, like on the road to Emmaus, the Lord had to take him to the Old Testament and prove it out in the scriptures themselves. So our question is, where is it that Paul taught that the temple must be built before the rapture could take place? And the answer, as we'll see, is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The next question is, where did Paul get the information from the Lord when it was revealed to him? And the answer for that, as we will see, is Daniel chapter 8. So first, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is where Paul was teaching that the temple would already be in existence before the rapture happens, that the rapture can't happen unless the temple has been rebuilt. So let's begin together, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, of course, that's the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by a letter as if from us, as though or to the effect that the day of Christ had come. Notice, first of all, that the day of Christ was just another way of referring to the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together to him. Why? Because that's when he comes. He comes in that day. He comes in the day of the Lord when the sixth great day ends and the seventh great day begins. That's the day of the Lord. You could also call it the day of Christ. Many expressions to that effect. It's his day. So don't be shaken in mind or troubled as though the day of Christ had come. Now that expression, had come, didn't mean that it had happened already and they just didn't know about it. The expression rather meant that it was at hand, that his coming and the gathering of ourselves to him was about to happen. So he goes on to say, let no one deceive you by any means for that day or his coming and our being gathered to him will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now let's just stop right there for a moment. Did you get the emphasis, the emphatic truth of what Paul just said. In effect, he was saying, the Lord can't come. The rapture cannot happen unless the man of sin is revealed. We'll get to the falling away in a moment, but remember it says, and the man of sin is revealed. So right there we know that the Lord cannot come, nor can the rapture happen before the man of sin is revealed. He's revealed first before the Lord comes and we're taken back with him to the Father's house. That's the truth of this passage. 
Now, the question we could ask at this point, which Paul will later answer, is what event causes the man of sin to be revealed? How will we know who he is? I mean, right now, this is 2024, the month of September. We don't know yet who he is. We know he's going to be the king of the north, referring to the area of the land of Magog or Turkey. We know that much, but we don't know his identity. And we won't know until it's time for him to be revealed. And then when it is, how will we know? What event will reveal him to us? That's what you're going to learn in this video. So as we keep reading, we'll build some foundation for this. Verse 4 says, or tells us, what he eventually does which is he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. In effect, Paul was saying it's not time yet for one thing. Um, that's a significant thought because they were still basically 2,000 years away from where we are right now. They had not fulfilled or come to the end of the sixth great day from the creation of Adam. So Paul is telling them there is a time and we're not there yet. And there's also things that have to happen and we haven't seen them yet. Now it's important to understand that when Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, the temple of Jesus' time had not yet been destroyed. He wrote this letter before 70 AD, but he knew it would be destroyed. How did he know that? Because Jesus had pronounced desolation upon that temple that not one stone would be left standing. So the revelation here is by Paul ascribing the time of this man to some future time that had not yet come, he understood and was acknowledging that in our time, as the return of Christ draws near, another temple will be rebuilt. And this is the temple that the Antichrist will desecrate and sit in and declare that he is God. But here's the question. Is that the event that will reveal who he is? Is that how we will know who he is? And the answer is no. We will be gone before that happens. And this is the beauty of Paul's teaching. He's going to answer the question then, what event specifically will enable us to recognize this man of sin, know that it's him, and yet that event will be so powerful that it will cause the coming of the Lord and the rapture to happen before this Antichrist can actually sit in the temple and declare that he's God. In other words, we'll see just the very beginning, but we will not be here for his final three and one half years in which he imposes the mark of the beast and the image of the beast and so forth. Would you like to know what event that is? Well, you have to keep reading and you have to follow what Paul was teaching and even better, understand where he got the revelation that he's teaching them. So to understand that, let's just skip ahead a few verses and Paul's going to reveal where it was that he got this. So skip ahead to verse 8 where he says, And then the lawless one will be revealed Get this part, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. This is not any ordinary man. And his destruction or demise does not come in any ordinary way. Instead, it's the Lord who consumes him with the breath of his mouth and destroys him with the brightness of his coming. And then another critical feature, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, if you have a good 
cross-reference Bible, or if you study enough to know where to go, if that doesn't sound familiar to you, you can check it out with the cross-references. Find the connections. That's what I tell people when you're studying. You need the connections. You need the bridges that take you from this revelation to its counterpart somewhere else. It's a piece of the puzzle over here, and you need to find the piece that goes next to it. That's the connections. That's how you put the puzzle together. That's how Scripture interprets Scripture, so we don't have to just depend on someone's opinion. Hallelujah. So when we find an, the bridge and follow it, we come to Daniel chapter 8, which I'll read this and see if it doesn't sound familiar, what Paul was just teaching, because this is where he got it. It says, in the latter time of their kingdom, this is Daniel 8, verse 23, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features. He understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Or as he said over here, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And then as you read on, um, it says that, in verse 25, the end, he shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means or ordinary means. Well, isn't that what he said here in verse 8? The lawless one will be revealed, but the Lord will consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness or the epiphania of his parousia, his presence. That's being broken without human means. That's being broken by superhuman means, by the Son of God, the Son of Man, Messiah the Prince. So another feature that he gave us, which links us to Daniel chapter 8, because this is going to answer all of our questions, is the word transgressors in the Hebrew here in Daniel 8. And the word Paul used back in verse 3, the falling away. These two things, this is Paul teaching from Daniel 8, in a sense, and using it to prove to them what must happen as we approach the end of this age. So, unless the falling away comes first. Now, I'm going to take you to my screen and I'm going to show you uh, my e-sword, and we're going to do a little word study, okay? So let's do that right now. So here we are on my screen, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Man of Lawlessness, and down here, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, except there comes a falling away first. Notice here, the word falling away, and I have clicked on this word, so down here is the definition. Apostasia in the Greek, it is and means a defection from truth, an apostasy, a falling away, or to forsake. Interestingly, there is another insight here that it is the feminine form, this word apostasia, is feminine of this word, which means the same thing, which signifies something that has separated, or in particular, a divorce, a divorcement. Well, isn't that what the children of Israel did? Jesus said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I came to my own, but my own did not receive me. We all know that they were married, in a sense, to Jehovah but they rejected his son. They rejected the Messiah. And so they were divorced. As in the story of Esther, the king found another wife. And that's the bride. That's the church of Jesus Christ. Now, keep this in mind, the word apostasy, because now we're going to go to our bridge and we're going to go to Daniel and we're going to go to chapter 8, and we're going to scroll down till we come to the part about the transgressors. 
right here, verse 23, and the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors, if I click on this, notice Pasha, a primitive root, means to break away from just authority. That is to trespass. And here it is, to apostatize, to revolt, rebel. In other words, Paul chose a word in his letter to the Thessalonians that meant an apostasy and then found the same Hebrew word to roughly mean the same thing. Here in Daniel 8, the word transgressors in the English is and means an apostasy. So what is the purpose of this? It is a bridge. He is linking us by the revelations he's teaching from this vision and by the words he's using. In essence, he's saying, go to Daniel 8. This is where the Lord taught me. And this will answer your question. What is it that reveals the man of sin even before he sits in a rebuilt temple? What is it? Well, when we study the vision in Daniel 8, which if you're listening to those from the past, and if you're just parroting what others have taught, they will tell you this is a vision already fulfilled in the past by a Greek general, Atticus Epiphanes. But I think I've shown you that, that the Apostle Paul, one who knew the history of his own people better than anyone today, he understood this vision to be about a future man of sin whose power was not his own and who is not destroyed by human means. He understood this vision to be about the coming Antichrist. And he's pointing us, he was pointing the Thessalonians to this passage so that we could understand how, under what circumstances, is the man of sin revealed to us the church so that we can't be deceived well when we study this out we find that it's all about this little horn and in verse 11 he exalts himself as high as the prince of the host by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down wait a minute that would mean that in our time because paul is talking about our time a future time of the man of sin when the coming of the Lord will destroy him that in that time there will be a sanctuary a rebuilt temple there will be daily sacrifices happening if you remember what he said that day his coming the rapture will not happen unless the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed what's the significance of this apostasy why is it such a transgression in god's sight why does the interpretation of the vision say in verse 23 when the transgressors when the apostates have reached their fullness their completion well think about it we know who fell away the falling away of the Jewish people, even though there's coming a time when their blindness will be restored as a people. Nevertheless, they're falling away. Through their fall, riches came to us, the Gentiles, right? But what is it that completes their falling away to its final point? Is it not, as we hear today, that they want to go back and rebuild a temple? And our question would be, why do you need a temple? God's got a living temple. You can be part of it. You can be a living stone in that temple. The foundation and the capstone is the Messiah Prince. Oh, I see. But you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, who died on a cross for all of our sins, who was raised from the dead by the glory of God, you don't believe that he's the Messiah? So... Instead, you're going to build another temple and go back to the blood of lambs and goats and cows and sheep because the Lamb of God, His blood is not good enough for you? 
Can you see why the Holy Spirit, why God the Father would look on this act and say this completes your apostasy to its fullness. When you rebuild the temple and you go back to the blood of these sacrifices that I said long ago, I have no more pleasure in them. My son's blood is all I need. Once he shed his blood and presented it to me, I accepted it for all people, for all time, so that he sat down. When he said it is finished, in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, he brought the need for sacrificial offerings to a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath end. So, verse 12, because of transgression, here's how he is revealed, the Antichrist. Here's our answer. Because of transgression, this final apostasy, an army was given over to the little horn to do what? to oppose the daily sacrifices. And who is this army? Well, we now know from the other scriptures that it's this 10 king coalition that give their authority to this little horn, the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast. And when I see who's leading that army, that's the beast. That's the Antichrist. Yes, we will know him just before we exit this world because God tells us that when the day of the Lord is at hand, this invasion will take place. That's when they're crying peace and safety, Paul said, and yet it's sudden destruction for them. That day overtakes them that way like a thief, but it doesn't need to overtake us because we can see the day approaching. That's when we escape and God turns out the lights, a darkened sun, a blood red moon, starlight diminished. When you see that, know that he's about to break through the seen realm and reveal himself to all of humanity. Who is able to stand when he appears? Well, he gave us the answer. Those who are eagerly looking for him will be counted worthy, will receive the overcoming strength, the resurrection strength, to escape all these things that will come to pass and the rest of the world, the things that will follow. And instead, we will stand before the Son of Man, before the Father and His throne in the third heaven. Won't that be glorious? So the puzzle of end time prophecy is coming together for us by following the bridges and the connections. We now know that this age will end as we approach the end of this 6,000 years. That at that time, a Jewish temple will be rebuilt and the sacrifices, the daily offerings, will resume. This will anger Israel's enemies in the Middle East, principally a 10-nation coalition, and they will offer their armies in support of a little horn. We will then recognize who he is, and he will come against Israel, invade their land with this army. This invasion will precipitate the coming of the Lord in which he will stand on the Mount of Olives and split the mountain in two, creating a wide valley so that the remnant in Israel can flee through that valley. At the same time as they go through, we, the church, the bride, will go up. And as they see us go up, they will then say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thus, our third day resurrection and ascension with Christ will trigger their third day revival when they come back to the Lord and they believe on his name. Another important piece to place here is what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 29, in which he said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven 
Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This celestial sign of darkness triggers the end of an age-long tribulation that has encompassed the entire time of the church. Great tribulation. It will bring it to an immediately end, and it will trigger the wrath of God in the day of the Lord. And so this is where he sends his angels and gathers us, his elect, the church, from the four winds and takes us back to his father's house to be seated at his right hand, just as he overcame to sit with the father in his throne. This will then precipitate the final three and one half years of the Antichrist in which he is ultimately consumed and destroyed as we continue to reign in his courts during the day that's better than a thousand elsewhere.